Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what I wanted to do is really introduce you to the concept of zero trust and how it can resolve your securities identity crisis. So one good thing to start with is our industry has spent far more money to address cybersecurity challenge over the last few years. 86 billion in 2017, that number is supposed to increase to 96 billion. So great job, give yourself a round of applause. However, I'm starting to scratch my head every morning when I wake up and read or hear about the next cyber data breach. What's going on? About 66% of companies are still getting breached and it's getting worse. They're getting breached on average five or more times. So something is not working here in the equation. So when we look at who's exposed, we hear all about these big data breaches at Equifax and at Uber, and it's not just North American consumers that are impacted, but across Europe. But it's not just the big brand names that are impacted, and the number of, of exposures has increased five times over the last few years, and the cost associated has risen. And it's not, as I said, about the marquee brands. It can be small companies. There's a UK-based shipping services company called Clarkson. When they underwent the ransom attack, their stock went down 3%. So everybody should be concerned about how can we tackle this problem. Unfortunately, things are not getting better. Companies have outsourced their IT development and, and environments into the cloud. About 90% nowadays host that in the cloud. We use a lot of enterprise cloud solutions, SAP, Salesforce. It really expands the attack surface. And then there's that smartphone that we brought into the enterprise and that creates a special challenge for organizations. And then there's this acronym, IOT, Internet of Things. Most people don't even think about it, but it's already present. I'm not talking about Alexa or Google Home sitting on your nightstand. I'm really talking about IOT applications within the enterprise. Target was a good example. Most people did not realize Target was an IoT device, a smart climate system that was attacked and then used for lateral movement. So all of these components really contribute to an expanding attack surface. Now, I wanted to keep this interactive and ask you, what do you think are the cybersecurity tactics that are most effective against cyber attacks? Is it network security? Is it next-gen endpoint security? Vulnerability management? Identity and access management? Data security? So please use your application to kind of vote on what you believe is the most effective tool. Waiting for a couple of seconds to kind of get the results in here. So please use your application. Okay, so identity and access management, congratulations. I knew I'm coming to a smart place. Unfortunately, it's not the common perception. If you look at surveys that are being conducted across the world, people believe and follow the hype of marketing of many vendors. Threat intelligence, endpoint security, you go to the big trade shows, that's where the focus is. We just conducted a research study with Wall Street Journal where we asked C-level people what their perception is. What's the most effective tool? 62% of CEOs believed it's malware software that can handle that. Disappointing. Let's do another poll. What do you believe is the primary attack point for today's data breaches and knowing that I and with smart people it's in the room, it's probably an easy answer, software attack, network attack, or human attack surface. What do you believe? A 
Okay, again, right on the nail. Because reality is that post-mortem analysis shows that identity is the top attack vector. 81% of today's hacking-related attacks originate with weak, stolen, or compromised credentials. 81%. That's why you're in this room. That's why you want to progress the agenda focused on identity management, not on endpoint security, not on anything else. So when I look at this new threat landscape where attackers camouflage their data breaches with legit identities, there needs to be a rethinking of security. If I put a firewall in, if I put a data encryption in, it doesn't really address the number one attack factor. If I am a person that has authorized to access data, to decrypt data, I have access as a hacker. That's the problem, and that's where zero trust comes in. Zero trust assumes that bad actors already exist inside and outside of your network. So don't trust your CEO. Don't trust your VP of IT. And if that's the case, if that's the new reality, you have to remove trust from the equation. And so the core principles of zero trust, which was originally introduced by Forrester in collaboration with the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and today's practice like companies, Google and their Beyond initiative have deployed that. It's really based on, on three standards. One is you need to know about who is trying to access your resources. You need to know about the devices that they're using because they might represent a specific risk. And you must always authorize. So in the olden days, we talked about always trust, but verify. But these things have changed. Today, you can never trust. You always need to verify. So with this in mind, I want to talk about the four pillars of zero trust security. It's about verifying the user. It's about validating their device, limiting access and privilege and then learning and adapting. And so let's go through each of these pillars and kind of fill in a little bit more details. So when we look at verifying the user, it's important to really consolidate your identities. There are a lot of practices still common in the enterprise where system administrators share root admin passwords. If you do that, you don't know if Torsten George or John Doe accessed a server. And therefore, there's no accountability. There's no way to find out who really did what. And so consolidating identity, tying it back to Active Directory is one first important step, followed by applying single sign-on. Obviously, we're all human. I can't remember even my wife's cell phone number, so she always gives me a tough time for that. But fact is that people use a single password across all the different applications. Doesn't matter what your IT manager is telling you about security standards, you're doing it, you're human. So applying single sign-on really helps not just with productivity, but more importantly, security, because it doesn't expose your username and password in a manner uh, of the middle attack, but instead really uses one-time password technologies to inject and get you access, secure access to the application. The second thing is multi-factor authentication everywhere. It's something that we preach, and when we talk about multi-factor uh, everywhere, we're not just talking about applying this to applications, but we're applying it to endpoints. We're applying it to infrastructure, meaning servers. And we're also extending it beyond your end users. You should apply it to your system administrator. You should apply it to customers, and you should apply it to your partners. The third step is really leveraging behavior-based access. If I'm currently here in Munich, and I'm not here very often, then this represents, obviously, an abnormal behavior. And therefore, I should be challenged 
to step up my authentication and provide another factor. The other thing, the second pillar was about validating the device. So a very fundamental step, especially with the bring your own device uh, movement was how can I manage the device? How can I manage the applications? That's a foundational use case. But you have to think beyond that. You have to look at the device context, the security posture. If I'm connecting here and I'm connected to the public network, obviously the device that I'm leveraging to access my network represents a higher risk when I do that from my home office. The other thing is you have to apply endpoint privilege management. What do I mean? For the server side, we're all familiar with privileged management. But on the laptops that you have sit in front of you while I'm talking here, there's an admin account. And so you have to lock this down too, because otherwise it's a blind spot. It's something that somebody can take advantage of. When it comes to the third pillar, and that's the central pillar of zero trust security, it's about limiting access and privilege. So in the first step, you should really apply granular role-based access and limit the privilege to limit lateral movement. In the first step, you should define zones. If I'm a database manager, I should only have access to that database and not to our financial system or other systems. So that's the first step. The second step is, I'm a database administrator, I'm talking to you right now. Why would have somebody assign to me the privilege to access that database right now? Why? I don't need it. I'm talking with you. So limiting access, providing it just in time is very important to really allowing to keep hackers out of your network. The other thing is auditing everything, doing session recording so that you can go back and you can see what is really going on. What command did that person apply when they entered into the server system? So the fourth pillar is around learning and adapting. Taking all the different data points from the user, from the device, from the limited access, the access requests that are coming in, and applying machine learning technology and automatically blocking access. The earlier speaker talked about at Microsoft, they have 64 access policies. If I would have to maintain them on an ongoing basis for each individual user, that's a lot of time, a lot of uh, headcount that I have to apply. With machine learning technology, you can modify the user profile. If I'm coming to Munich on a monthly basis, it's no longer abnormal behavior, it becomes regular behavior, and therefore my user profile should be uh, amended and my access policy should be changed accordingly. So when we talk about zero trust security and we're on a road there, we hear a lot of times everybody nodding their head and saying, yep, that's, that's the right approach, but to move away from too many passwords, too much privilege, I'm not a Google. I can't start from Greenfield. I can't rebuild everything that I have built over the last decades. And that's a good, a good question. How can you achieve zero trust security with your current environments? The good news, it's a step-by-step -step approach. You don't need to do everything at once. You can do it really in digestible pieces. You can start with establishing identity assurance, things like multi-factor authentication everywhere, SSO everywhere. You can then move on to limiting the lateral movement by establishing access zones, applying conditional access, protecting your DevOps environment as part of the overall environment, and then moving towards enforcing least privilege and really applying just-in-time privilege, just enough privilege, and then ultimately moving towards a continuous monitoring approach as it's even propagated by NIST and really analyzing the risk, monitoring all sessions, and potentially in real time sending out alerts and intervening uh, with any abnormal behavior. 
So we worked with a research firm and, and kind of looked at the spectrum of, of customers that we're serving to kind of see if they are applying these best practices. What's the outcome? It's nice to talk about models and, and ideas, but what really counts is the impact on an organization. So for those organizations that apply this zero trust security model, they're really able within month of implementation to cut their risk exposure by half. The insurance companies love it. And they can cut their cost tremendously and also the cost on, on technology because if you apply that and you offer it as a single platform, you're really able to do vendor consolidation. So instead of fragmented identity and access management technologies, you can use a single platform to apply that. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you. If you have any further question, please feel free also to stop by our booth. We're one of the uh, platinum sponsors here, so uh, glad to answer any question at the booth also. Thank you. Um, so zero trust definitely is an interesting topic. Um, I'm personally not a believer in the term zero trust because it's more maybe a distributed trust than oh. zero trust. If we wouldn't have trust at all. Um, so, so maybe the term, but it, that's not your mistake. It's probably the mistake of the <laughs> ones who invented the term yes. zero trust, which is uh, not the very best, I, I believe. But the concept behind that, I think, is something which is very important because we have the end of the perimeter. And so we don't have this wall which protects our castle anymore in that sense. And so we need to move to new yep. architectures. Let's have a look at the questions. Um, we have a couple of questions mm -hmm. here. Maybe let's start with the number three here. Um, you talked about machine learning and your system at some time learns that you're more frequent in Munich. But if you already know that you'll be in Munich, mm -hmm. if your Outlook calendar tells that you're in Munich, shouldn't the system reflect this as well? That's correct, and I can kind of combine the first question and the second uh, and the third question. It's it's really best security is invisible, correct? We all know that. If, if you provide a barrier to an end user that they have to do something, they don't want to do it. They're not doing it. So leveraging machine learning technology is really a big promise in our industry because it really can take other input sources like Outlook and contextualize that data related to your identity and the behavior that you have shown. So it really minimizes any human interaction. It, it adapts your user profile, your behavior profile. And so also to answer the first question, machine learning can really tremendously help with usability in the identity and access management space. Mm -hmm. OK, so also let's have a look at the second question. Right now, the third one. <laughs> um, so, so how how to get the security department? I think we talked about a CEO in, in an earlier Q and A. Uh, the security department, which might, you know, be used to traditional perimeter-based security. How to get them on board for the new concept? Is it a challenge, or is it just something which today works seamlessly? I, I think we have seen over the last eighteen months a shift where. <laughs> Uh, in the past, was very everything was very compliance-focused, and I would say risk has become the new uh, compliance. And with the risk focus, the mindset also shifted within the security departments. And so it's easier to communicate to them the benefits of zero-trust security. And at the end of the day, uh, they're nowadays being pushed. I think Target was a watershed event where the board members were put into a liable spot. And so the boards are far more involved nowadays and are really pushing down the mandate to do something. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, there's still a lot of focus on, on unnecessary tools and not necessary on identity access. Okay, management. perfect. Thank you. And you will be probably at your booth. So yes. if for the other questions, just visit the Centrify booth and ask Thorsten directly. Thank you very much again for your keynote and the insights on Zero Trust. And with that, um, I just want to highlight a quick things coming up. So we have a woman in identity lunch um, today. And there's a GDPR Excellence Lounge uh, where you can talk with GDPR expert lawyers. Um, the lounge happening today and tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the gallery. Um, 
the women in identity lunch uh, um, being this noon up there. Have a look at this. Um, right now we have coffee networking. So that's the immediate thing to get some caffeine or some <laughs> something to eat. After that, we restart at 11 in the various um, rooms with the tracks. So enjoy the coffee break and see you later in one of the other sessions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.